yet another October 2, Mahatma Gandhi's birth anniversary. And from the New Limb team, you have asked me to speak something on Gandhi. To begin with, let me make it clear that I am not a Gandhi expert, nor am I a Gandhian. But what I can tell is that as a student of sociology, I have deep interest in the realm of the politics, spirituality, culture, and civilization. And it was in this context that I engaged with Gandhi, Gandhi's major text, and I did think about Gandhi. So what I am going to speak before you is essentially coming out of that engagement with Gandhi, both as a student of social science as well as as a concerned citizen, deeply concerned with the fate of our times. To make the discussion very concrete and focused, there are primarily three things that I wish to concentrate on. First, I would talk about Gandhi's experiments. Gandhi's experiments with life, truth, Gandhi's transparency. Second, I would talk about Gandhi's civilizational vision, Gandhi's reading of modernity and the modern civilization. And third, I would talk about the way Gandhi engaged with both the political and the spiritual simultaneously. And I believe that if we throw light on these three important aspects of Gandhi's oceanic life and politics, we would be possibly able to throw some light on the way Gandhi looked at the world and the kind of things that you and I can learn from Gandhi. So to begin with, let me refer to Gandhi's experiments with truth. Now the very word experiment, as you would argue, and you would agree with me, means that one is constantly evolving, one is not taking things for granted, one is experimenting, amending, altering, looking at oneself and trying to evolve constantly. So it is an experiment with truth that means that Gandhi is not taking things for granted that what the scriptures have said. Instead, through his own politics, through his own life, through his own conscience, Gandhi is perpetually looking at himself, working on himself, and through that, engaging with the domain of truth. That's why this very word experiment, I believe, is quite appealing and promising. And when we look at and read Gandhi's autobiography or my experiment with truth, what immediately strikes us, and I believe that as the new limb works in the field of culture and education, it would also strike you is the extraordinary honesty and transparency that one could see in Gandhi's experiment with truth, the way Gandhi revealed himself, all his mistakes, follies, the way he grew, evolved, his anxiety, his guilt, his experiment with himself, his experiment with truth, his process of constant elevation and evolution. I just wish to speak of three experiments very quickly in order to give you an idea of the range of Gandhi and the way he evolved. The first experiment that I would talk about, you know, what immediately comes to my mind, is in South Africa, when during a railway journey, Gandhi's friend Mr. Pollock gave him a slim book to read. And as the train started and Gandhi opened the book and Gandhi described in his experiment with truth, the moment I began to read the book, I could not do anything else. The entire night I read the book and the next morning when I got up I felt that it is a magic spell of the book and this book has transformed me and I thought that the principles of this book I would try to apply in my own life, in the culture and the politics I would engage with. And that is Gandhi's engagement with John Ruskin, Ruskin's son to the last. And Gandhi ended that chapter by saying that what I learned from Ruskin is the essentially the dignity of labor. The work of a barber is as significant as the work of a laborer. 
And second, Gandhi said that I learned the principle of Sharbodaya. That means the good of the individual is deeply related to the good of the collective, to the welfare of the collective. And Gandhi ended that chapter by saying that I decided to apply this principle into my own life. And Gandhi eventually translated this book into his own language, Gujarati. So the magic spell of a book indicates the way, for example, Gandhi was engaging with truth. Now, if you go deeper into this experiment, you see that here Gandhi is completely descriptualizing and deep Brahminizing his engagement with Hinduism. Because in a very classicist Brahminical Hinduism, there is a duality between the mental, cognitive labor on the one hand and manual labor on the other. But here, from Ruskin, now Gandhi was learning that the dignity of labor and the job of a barber is as significant as the job of a laborer. That means he was completely de the text and he was altering the meaning of the text. He was experimenting with truth and the good of the individual is deeply related to the good of the collective. So it was an attack on the hierarchy, on the hierarchical division. The second experiment that I would refer to is, again in South Africa, when in Tolstoy farm, Gandhi opened that Tolstoy farm and a lot of children stayed in the Tolstoy farm and the way Gandhi as a father figure, as a moral guardian, began to experiment with them and evolved his principle of education. And in Experiment with Truth, he wrote that in that process he learned one thing. Gandhi said that I learned that the textbook is not the only mode of learning. And as Gandhi said, if I have learned to alter myself, look at myself, radiate what I speak, that I learned from the Tolstoy farm. So children are constantly seeing me, living with me, observing me. Only if through my own life I radiate love, I radiate non-violence and radiate truth, they would learn it. So no moral lesson can be learned through sermonizing or through textbook. It has to be learned only through living and the constant engagement between the learner and the teacher. And the second thing again Gandhi said that at Tolstoy form what I did is that I was once again trying to break the duality of intellectual labor and manual labor. So children would be engaged in all sorts of activities right from gardening work to scavenging, to cooking work, all sorts of things children would be engaged. So the way they would learn, they would grow up not with the duality and the distinction that intellectual labor is pure and the manual labor is polluted. We all know that one of the central principles of caste system is centered on this purity and pollution dichotomy. And Gandhi's attack on the caste system is essentially centered on his relentless critique through his life and practice of this duality of purity and pollution. So Tolstoy form is another significant experiment. And third experiment that immediately comes to my mind is what Gandhi wrote about his engagement with Kosturba Gandhi, that is the domestic Shottagraha, where Gandhi said that as Kosturba was repeatedly falling sick and Gandhi through his knack with herbal medicine realized and thought that if Kosturba gives up salt, then it would take care of her health and it would heal Kosturba. Gandhi proposed time and again that Kosturba, you should give up salt. Kosturba didn't have much faith in Gandhi's medicine and one day Kosturba became furious and she asked Gandhi, is it possible for you to give up salt? And then Gandhi replied, I have already given up salt. And then Kosturba realized that here is a person who is telling me to do something which he has already told. And Gandhi described that the tears falling from Gandhi's eyes, at Kosturba's eyes, and it was one of the sweetest memory in our conjugal life. And it was also, in a way, first experiment with Shottagraha, or with domestic Shottagraha, that if you fight, if you resist, you have to be committed to the truth. You have to live with that truth. So it is this commitment to truth, you know, that gives you the strength to fight, to alter someone, to change someone, you know. And so this entire book, my experiment with truth, are full of these experiments. 
small, innovative, beautiful experiment. And that possibly led many scholars, say Bhikkhu Parekh and others, to tell that these experiments eventually transformed Mohandas into a charismatic Mahatma Gandhi. Now, the second aspect that I wish to share with the new Lim is Gandhi's civilizational vision and Gandhi's reading of modernity and colonial modernity. And I believe there are two principles, you know, which come very strikingly in Gandhi's celebrated text called the Hind Sharaj. The first principle is that, as Gandhi was saying, that entire colonialism and colonial modernity is satanic. It is based on brute force. It is based on aggression. It is based on violence. And hence, our agenda of decolonization, our struggle for Sharaj, should not mean that white rule being replaced by the brown rule. Gandhi was repeatedly saying that true Sharaj and freedom would mean that we alter the logic of the game itself and it leads to a massive paradigm shift. So brute force has to be replaced by soul force. And it was this soul force that Gandhi repeatedly emphasized. With this soul force, we would decolonize our consciousness and we would create a new civilization. And that new civilization would be the gift of India in the process of decolonization struggle. And that civilization would be centered on altogether different principles which are qualitatively different from the principles of very techno-scientific, mechanized, aggressive modernity. Because Gandhi was repeatedly arguing that we want a civilization in the process of decolonization and fighting brute force through soul force, a civilization which is engaged in the principle of harmony, harmony between the human species and nature, harmony between human living and habitat and the ecosystem. And it also ought to be based on certain principles of austerity, certain principle of austerity. And that's why Gandhi said, that with this kind of modern civilization, what has happened is that mind has become a restless bird. The more it desires, the more it wants, the more violent it becomes. And it is this violence and restlessness that we see all around. And we are trying to find salvation only in the machine, only in the outer things of life. But true salvation, as Gandhi would argue, lies in the soul force, lies in the soul force. So it is the power of the spirit, it is the power of the soul force that would enable us to create a civilization which would be qualitatively different from technocentric consumption-oriented civilization in which our orientation is primarily centered on the outer spectacle and the outer comforts and the technological indulgence. I believe that in Hinsharaj, the seeds of the critique of modernity that we see that possibly have tremendous potential and that could be further tapped, you know, to evolve an alternative culture, a counter culture and counter hegemony for creating a new civilizational vision. The civilization that we're living in is crumbling because of its non-sustainable development plan, because of its technological violence, because of its consumerism and the kind of violence that we see all around. So is there a way out? Is it possible to have a counter hegemony? I believe that one has to work with Hind Sharaj pretty seriously on this front. And the third thing that I wish to talk about and refer to is essentially about Gandhi's engagement with both the political and the spiritual. This, I believe, is something quite fascinating. Because on the one hand, we have a reading of politics where politics is primarily Machiavellian, primarily instrumental, you know. And on the other, we have a reading of the spiritual, that when you engage with the spiritual, you engage primarily with your own sadhana, with your own meditation, and you tend to, for example, remove yourself from the nasty domain of the politics, you know. You tend to see it as a diversion. So we often see this kind of a dichotomy between the political and the spiritual. I believe that Gandhi's uniqueness 
lies in the fact that he was trying to unite the two. So, in the preface to experiment with truth, Gandhi would say that one thing I have realized that the more I seek to engage myself in the domain of the political, the more spiritual I become. So what happened that Gandhi chose the political realm as the site of his shadhana, site of his religious quest and the search. And that's why as he would argue, all the associated meaning with religiosity now, Gandhi with his junior, genius would give a completely new meaning to it. So for example now, ahimsa or non-violence, it no longer remained merely a Jain or Buddhist principle of ahimsa or non-injury. It now became also a large-scale weapon for the political resistance and the struggle. And similarly, for example, fasting, you know, fasting is very popular in all religious traditions, in Hinduism, in Jain tradition, in Islam, but the way Gandhi attached meaning to the fasting, that fasting is also, for example, working with oneself, purifying one's own self, fighting the lust and greed within oneself, and preparing oneself as a Shottagrahi for fighting the truth. And it was in that contest, Gandhi's first into death, Gandhi's Shottagraha, Gandhi's hunger strike as a political weapon and its moral appeal, it, truth has to be seen, you know. So it was also an act of sadhana, but now he also brought it into the larger domain of the collective emancipation and the welfare. So his perpetual engagement with the political and the spiritual, and I think with this engagement, he was constantly engaging with a lot of religious symbols, but he was altering their meaning completely. That's why Ram Rajya, in Gandhi's connotation, became a kind of utopia, a future non-violent socialist world filled with decentralization, oceanic circle, decentralization of power, and a harmonic man-nature relationship with austerity as a principle of living. You know? So it became more like a utopian vision for a future civilization and a future world. And it has got nothing to do with the language of religious fundamentalism. So this constant negotiation with the political and the religious, that I think many didn't understand. Many didn't understand Gandhi's symbolism and many also misunderstood Gandhi. Traditionally, I believe, it became a problem for Indian leftists for quite some time, you know, to understand this Gandhi's subtle domain of engagement with the political and the spiritual. I would just end my note, my discussion with you by saying that when you look at these three aspects, that Gandhi's experiments with truth, that means constantly evolving, working on self, Gandhi's profound critique of modernity and an alternative civilizational vision that we see in his Hind Swaraj, and third, Gandhi's engagement with the political and the spiritual, then you do realize that it's a life that has constantly evolved and progressed. And it's a life of journey. It is a life of constant journey. When I think of this journey, there are three things that come to my mind and which I believe have constantly inspired the artist, painters, poets, sculpture. One Gandhi walking through Dandi March. What is mundane salt, Gandhi transformed it. It became a symbol for collective national awakening and emancipation. Gandhi walking through Dandi, you know, it was like a political pilgrimage. Gandhi walking after village after village in the turbulent Noakhali in the 40s and visiting communally <coughs> violent villages and households in Noakhali and experiencing all sorts of hostility and single-handedly trying to appease people and create an harmony and bringing about a ray of hope and light in darkness. 15th August 1947, Gandhi on fasting in Kolkata and then when Gandhi came to Delhi and what immediately comes to my mind is the Gandhi's last walking for his prayer meeting and then 
at about 5.15, January 30, 1948, he was going for the prayer meeting and then we all know how that journey ended. Now Nathuram Godse came, who represented yet another kind of a worldview and his bullets penetrated into Gandhi's body and Gandhi fell into ground. And that led us to that question, what is the meaning of that death, you know? Is it only the death of the physical body and the temporal or whether through Godse's bullets, Gandhi's relevance became more alive, more relevant and throughout ages we need to reinvent Gandhi and rediscover Gandhi and would not allow Nathuram Godse to finish Gandhi. He finished merely the body and the spirit that Gandhi represented that transcends the body of Mohandas Garam Chand Gandhi. That's a belief, that's a philosophy, that's an aspiration. So Gandhi has to be seen beyond the body of Gandhi. This is the way I just wish to end.